All right, friends. If we can start taking our seats. Thank you very much. Selfie snaps later, please. Yeah. I actually can't believe the day has passed so quickly. Um, and so let me just start by having a huge round of appreciation for all of the speakers, the panelists, the workshop organizers, the artists, the spoken word poets, all of our volunteers that have helped throughout the day and all the War on Want staff that have been running around. And of course, for all of yourselves for being part of what I hope you have felt has been an absolute incredible day. So let's appreciate it for everybody. During this festival, we've shared and connected between themes and struggles of pathways and journeys being mapped out, rooted, I think, as you can feel through all of the sessions, with the politics of anti-imperialism and anti-colonialism. I feel uh, a movement of movements being reborn in these very walls, celebrating our fights and our victories. And as you might have been heard in one or a couple of the sessions, Many of our campaigners on War on Want has been fighting for a very, very long time against the insidious ISDS, the Investor State Dispute Settlement Courts. And we had a great victory a couple of days ago with finally the UK announcing it's leaving the Energy, Char Energy Charter Treaty. And I want to thank all of the folks in the, in the activist workshop who made a banner to commemorate that. Rest in peace, the Energy Charter Treaty. That's very fitting. And it, again, shows the power of our movements. Uh, um, but when we do work and act together, and it was many, many different campaigns that came together to do that, that was a victory. And uh, sometimes our victories are far and few between, so we should definitely celebrate them as we, as we get them. Um, I also hope that few felt throughout this day that this, together, that this is not a time of doom, but now is the time for us to show that still we rise. And to close today, we want to echo the words of Maya, and, uh, Maya Angelou. You may shoot me with your words, you may cut me with your eyes, you may kill me with your hatefulness, but still, like air, I'll rise. And we have an amazing lineup of speakers to close our rally. Um, we're gonna come up one by one, Sobue Sikode, who's a lead, one of the leaders of one, the Shack Dwellers movement in South Africa, one of the largest and most important social movements. Jeremy Corbyn, uh, who needs no introduction. Uh, on our screens, we will be joined by Naomi Klein, who is recovering from a really bad bout of COVID, so we really appreciate her being able to even join us uh, on screen, and it's very early morning in Canada. Uh, Moira Milan from the Mapuche, Mapuche Nation, uh, indigenous leader. Um, Mina Raman from Third World Network, one of the most important organizations that have been fighting and support our governments and our movements. Um, so, um, we have, uh, so I'm going to, what I'm going to do, if you're happy, is ask you to come up one by one. So I'm gonna ask Sobui if you'd like to come up and share your thoughts, Sobui. My God. Th thank you, uh, Assad, for this wonderful opportunity, but also for sharing this wonderful platform with such wonderful names, uh, the heavyweights that are behind me. It's really an honor. So I come from South Africa. The Shack Dwellers Movement of South Africa, a movement that has been able to organize at least 120,000 members from the shanty towns of South Africa dealing with the issues of urban land, homelessness, and the question of dignity. So we've been successfully able to organize the unorganized because that's where the power lies. Somebody should not lie to you. Even those good ideas, great ideas, if they are not supported by popular masses on the ground, they are likely to fail. 
So the great thinkers here need to hear this. Your great ideas, if they have not won popular support on the ground, there are chances of failing. So it is important that we build the power from below so that the better, better world that we all are fighting for can give effect and meaningful on the graphs. So our work is to organize, we organize and organize. We've been successful in this organizing because we have created our own politics, our own philosophy, understood by ordinary men and women in the streets using the same language of the indigenous people because that are, those are the people that matter. So when we organize, we say to our communities, we are not going to struggle for you, but we are going to struggle with you. We are not going to do things for you, but we are going to do things with you because we want to empower while organizing. That's what we've been successful in doing. But putting the center of women's power in everything that we do in our movement to a point that we've been able to form a women's league on the side so that women have safe space, so that they can raise issues that affect them because they build our families, they build our neighborhoods, and they are so important. We also have the youth league on the one side to make sure that the issues of young people who are often bored by politics and so on can take a center stage when they themselves raise issues that affect them that are meaningful and that are priority to them. So it is always important to build a movement of movements, communes of communes, if we were to confront the global forces that have kept us in poverty, oppression, in wars and genocide. So I want to invite you to the, today that in order to humanize the world, we need to start thinking about building strong family values strong neighborhoods with great principles of Ubuntu, a sense of humanity, so that we can create the world that we all want. So I just want to close that organizing has not been easy. Many of us are carrying huge scars on our back for speaking truth to power. But by building and bringing masses together, to act in solidarity between and within struggling communities have created threats to power. We have threatened the power that the violence, state violence in particular, has left us torn apart. But the movement of courage and dignity that I have come to admire, that have nourished and created who I am to care about others, should be the movement that we all ought to join. So we are here in London to take our center stage. We take our place in our society. We take it humble, but very firm. So I want to conclude, ladies and gentlemen, by saying, Franz Fanon once said, each generation must discover its mission, fulfill it, or betray it. Maybe it is that time that we discover what we want with our lives, but it is very important that we protect our lands and our territory as the heritage to be cherished, to be enriched by future generations. So we have that responsibility that our kids have what they call home. I want to thank you. Thank you very much. It's uh, fantastic to be here at this closing session of the uh, War on Want conference. And uh, War on Want has been a sort of a lifetime sentence for me. I, f I first joined War on Want when I was 16 at school. And then I discovered my grandfather had been one of the founders of it as well before that, as he informed me after I joined it when I was trying to get him to give it some money. He said, <laughs> he said I, I set it up. <laughs> Um, and what is wonderful about War on Want is the way in which it's obviously global,
but it's empowering people, it's supporting people in struggle, it's helping people to organize, it's real acts of solidarity, it's not charity, it's solidarity, it's achievement, not sympathy. That's what War on Want achieves, and I think it is fantastic the way it's done things. <clears throat> and so, if it is supporting the people in the Western Sahara, is it is supporting people fighting back against occupation such as in West Papua or supporting the Palestinian people in the horrendous struggle they're going through at the present time. You can always rely on war on want to be there speaking up for people and trying to move politics in this country in a very good and general sense. And I have to say, having just caught the end of that discussion, what others were saying about Palestine and Gaza, Parliament is in a world of its own. It feels like a parallel universe on a different planet. When there are 80% of the people of this country wanting a ceasefire now in Gaza, Parliament is shilly-shallying around with some idiotic motions about procedure rather than dealing with the issue, which is the death of 30,000 people. <clears throat> And so, on Monday, I hope we will get another debate on Gaza. I hope that debate will result in a vote on a serious motion, which is serious about calling for a ceasefire, but also recognizing the horror of the occupation of the West Bank, the horror of the settlement policy, and please never forget them, the tens of thousands of Palestinians that have been for the past 70 years in refugee camps in Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, and all over the world. All of the Palestinian people deserve our support and our solidarity. <laughs> We also meet at a time when we are told there is no alternative to the current direction of the globe, which is one of neoliberal free market economics, which is creating greater and greater poverty, hunger, and inequality in the world, and doing horrendous damage to our environment, as the biggest businesses, the biggest polluters, spend millions of pounds on telling us their wonderful green achievements. We're being drowned in greenwash when we should be inspired by the solidarity of people trying to do something practical to protect this planet. The levels of inequality are totally unsustainable. When 1% uh, of the world's population own 45% of the global wealth, when 2,000 billionaires own the same amount of wealth as the equivalent of 4.6 billion people around the world, you've got to say there's something badly and seriously wrong with this planet. So the idea that we can simply support a continuation of free market economics and a continuation of growing trade arrangements which continue almost as a colonial legacy to impoverish the poorest people in the world and force particularly Africa, but also to a lesser extent Latin America and South Asia, to become exporters of primary products rather than produced products and continue that semi-subservient role that colonialism was designed to put them in forevermore. So the issues of inequality and injustice are central to it all, but also the fundamental issue of reparations for the colonial legacy that's left behind. So it's not, just, it's not just reparations in the sense of, quite rightly, returning those wonderful and brilliant works of art that are held in galleries and museums all over this country, indeed all over Europe, to where they should be in the first place, but it's also redressing the fundamental imbalances in trade and in investment. Jamaica was once the richest place in the world, and it was uh, denied all those riches by all that money being exported to the city of London. After lots of pressure on David Cameron to talk about reparations when he went back to Jamaica, he did indeed offer some reparations, and he offered to build a prison for, uh, for Jamaica as a gift from Britain. I, I don't know if that prison has ever been built, but I think really it would be ideal if it was called the David Cameron Penitentiary. 
I think that would be the sort of ideal name for it. And so it is about the demands we make for a fairer world through fairer trade, but also for investment in those, pe those people's production at the point of production rather than the export. So for example, making chocolate in West Africa rather than making it in Europe and so on. There are many, many other examples of it. But it's also about empowering people, which is what War on Want does. We are faced with, obviously, the most massive climate change emergency that the world has faced, certainly in our lifetimes and many, many before that. It's pretty obvious that there is massive damage being done to the world's atmosphere by greenhouse gas emissions as well as by pollution. But the effects, the effects of climate change do not fall evenly. It's the poorest kids in the poorest areas of the biggest cities, both in the West as well as in the uh, southern countries, that breathe the foulest air, have the shortest life expectancy, and many living alongside major roads, suffering from pollution, have lost 15% of their lung capacity before they even start school. That is what we're doing to a generation. And so when those people complain about controlling emissions, bringing about cleaner air, their determination to carry on with pollution and foul air is actually killing our children and killing our most vulnerable people. We've got to be very resolute on this. But don't make enemies of those that work in um, polluting industries. They didn't ask to work there. In many cases, there was no alternative. We have to have a green industrial revolution that guarantees and supports the workers in those industries through public investment while you convert them into something much more sustainable. You've got to take the entirety of the community with you on this journey to a cleaner and more sustainable planet. But you... You cannot, you cannot achieve that. You cannot achieve that unless you're prepared to be very, very determined about the direction in which the economy is going. If you have a free market economy dedicated to producing as much as it can for the greatest profit it can get, and the only thing you worship is money and the profit at the end of it rather than the sustainability of the entirety of the community, then you will carry on creating more pollution, you'll carry on creating more and more inequality and poverty. And so there has to be some really intelligent, long-term thinking about this. Universal basic income is one idea. There are many, many other ideas, but it also has to be put on a global scale as well. Because if we're to sustain life and sustain our, our quest for equality, you cannot do it if you merely adopt the economic model that has brought about the environmental destruction in the first place and brought about the inequality and the poverty both in the southern countries and in the poorest parts of the western countries as well. You have to have that critical economic thinking and I thank War on Want for the critical economic thinking it always does. But then you come back to what is happening now. The foul language that's used against refugees and asylum seekers. The disgusting Islamophobic comments made last night by one Tory MP and all the other racist comments that are made all the time. And then the condemnation of people that seek asylum in this country. I've been over to Calais quite a few times to talk to people who are attempting to board little boats to get to England. Why do they do it? I ask the question, why do you do it? They say, we have no alternative. I talk to people that had come by all kinds of means, from Afghanistan to Calais. They'd come in boats and trains and walking, buses, hitchhiking, all kinds of awful journeys, living in the most desperate poverty all along the way. They are victims of the war in Afghanistan, which billions and billions of dollars were invested in by Europe and North America. Then at the end of it, they've walked away, left the country in poverty, and left the victims to fend for themselves. And then they get abused by newspapers in this country for having the temerity to try to come to a place of safety. Tomorrow, those people that survive will be, will be our doctors, We'll be our engineers, we'll be our teachers, be our neighbours, be our train drivers, be our bus drivers, all kinds of things. But the abuse of them on the way. Wars have consequences. They go on forever. 
for those that are victims of the war because of the abuse of human rights and the destruction of their lives. And so, yes, it is about the war in Gaza. Yes, it is about trying to bring about a peace process between Ukraine and Russia. But it's also recognizing that there are other conflicts that are barely reported. The way in which the minerals wealth of the Democratic Republic of Congo has been sucked out by very powerful forces using, using child labor in order to um, sell the coltan on to the mobile phone manufacturers. There's a whole global chain around it. The big mining companies will wash their hands of it and say, absolutely nothing to do with us, knowing full well the minerals they're buying from their agents have been dug out of the ground by child labor, have been brought out in the most exploitative way possible. So all of these issues need to bring us together. We're all disempowered by the way our media reports the issues in the world. We're all told there's nothing you can do about things. But you know what? When you see millions of people out all around the world supporting the Palestinian people, despite what the world's media is saying about them, when you see people standing in solidarity with those suffering the most awful, awful situation in some of the poorest and most vulnerable places in the world, you feel inspired. The only thing that prevents us achieving so much more is our poverty of ambition of what we could achieve together. Gatherings like this bring together people who are used to campaigning in all kinds of circumstances, used to winning people over to sometimes difficult and complex arguments they've never heard before. War on Want has done this work so brilliantly for so long to unite people about the vision of a fairer, more just, sustainable, peaceful world. That's why I'm delighted and proud to be part of War on Want. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeremy. I actually didn't set him up to do our membership pitch, but thank you very much that you have. Um, I'm actually, hopefully, if on a click, we're going to be joined by one of our patrons as, as War and Want, uh, Naomi Klein, is again, somebody who needs little introduction, an award-winning journalist, columnist, uh, best-selling author of, of a number of books, many that have shaped our movement and our movement's thinking, um, from No Logo, Shock Doctrine, This Changes Everything, to, of course, her most recent book, Doppelganger, A Trip Into the Mirror World, which is an excellent book, you should all read it. Uh, she's widespread, widely read around the world and has been a columnist for The Guardian, and she's currently the Honorary Professor of Media and Climate at Rutgers University and uh, co-founder, uh, founding co-director of the Center for Climate Justice. Uh, she needs little uh, introduction, and I really, again, want to uh, say how much we appreciate. We know you're just recovering from a very bad bout of COVID, so we send you our love. Uh, Naomi Klein. Thank you. Hi, everyone. It is wonderful to be with so many um, friends and comrades, even if only remotely. And I want to thank you, Assad, especially um, when, when Assad, by the way, asked me if I would uh, help close out this gathering, his specific instructions were to speak about the political situation today and to do it in a way that was filled with hope. Um, so that's Assad for you. It's a bit of a tall order. And I have to say that I am not entirely sure that I can deliver uh, a brimming with hope uh, on a day like today. The last day, uh, the last time I was in London uh, in person, it was late September, uh, five months ago. But those five months, as I know so many of you uh, know, feel more like 100 years. 100 years of Palestinian parents wailing over their murdered and maimed children. 100 years of bombed schools and raided hospitals and desecrated mosques. A hundred years of Israeli soldiers making TikToks of their war crimes. A hundred years of teens trained in fascism blocking trucks filled with food. A hundred years of open calls to annihilate more than two million captive, occupied, ghettoized people. A hundred years of giddily expressed plans to turn Gaza into a parking lot, an Israeli beach town, a museum, 
a buffer zone. A hundred years of fired truth tellers and willfully obtuse pundits, a hundred years of universities that can't say Palestine, and a hundred years of NGOs that won't say genocide. A hundred years of failed and vetoed resolutions demanding a ceasefire. All of this does make it difficult to deliver a speech brimming with hope. What I can muster and what I feel more deeply than ever is resolve, commitment, commitment to the movements that this gathering represents, movements for true equality and justice, social, racial, gender, economic, and ecological justice, movements that exist in every country that have grown with tremendous speed over these past terrible months, grown not only in size of marches and blockades, but grown in the depth of their analysis, the willingness to make connections, to connect dots, to name underlying systems. And if these months have taught us anything, it is that our movements are all that we have. In your country, as well as mine, there is no moral leadership except the leadership springing up from the grassroots. All that we have is one another. We should pause over this because it is part of the horror and vertigo of our historical moment. Israel's annihilatory campaign on Gaza and on Palestinians is not the first genocide in modern history. Not the first time openly fascist forces have fused a violent supremacist ideology with seemingly limitless commitment to wipe out a people they consider a demographic threat. What is unique, at least since the era of open colonial genocides, is the unity this carnage has inspired among political elites in the global north, and to some extent beyond it. After all, when fascism rose in Europe in the 1930s, it had powerful supporters, but it also had powerful opponents in our political classes. And that is far less true today. All across what passes for a political spectrum, from the rabid far right to the mealy mouth center left, we have witnessed powerful actors putting their partisan differences aside to come together in active support of these crimes against humanity. Far from fracturing our political class, this iteration of fascism has united it. Donald Trump agrees with Joe Biden, Rishi Sunak with Keir Starmer, Emmanuel Macron with Marine Le Pen, Justin Trudeau with Georgia Maloney, Viktor Orban with Narendra Modi. And so we must ask, on what precisely do they all agree? What are they all uniting behind? What are they all defending? when they speak of Israel's right to defend itself. It's too simple, I'm afraid, to say that they are united in defense of a single state, though of course they are, but they are also united in defense of a shared belief system. Amidst the reality of global economic apartheid and accelerating climate breakdown that you have all been discussing today, they are united in a shared supremacist vision of safety and security for the few a vision that is the flip side of their steadfast refusal to in any way seriously address the underlying drivers of these crises, capitalism, limitless growth, colonialism, militarism, white supremacy, patriarchy. As Shireen Sakali puts it, we are in the age of catastrophe and Palestine is a paradigm. Israel, a kind of pioneer. For decades now, since giving up on all pretexts of a peace process, Israel has pursued its own security through an elaborate system of high-tech fences, walls, and its so-called Iron Dome shield that prides itself on its ability to intercept rockets and missiles and repel all threats. That system of high-tech surveillance and enclosure is a material reality on a particular geography. It is a way of life for Israelis and a way of slow death for Palestinians long before October 7th. But in addition to being those things, the Iron Dome is also a model, a super concentrated and claustrophobic version of the very same model of security to which all global North governments subscribe, the very same governments that have lined up behind Israel's 
genocidal campaign. It's a model in which the borders of wealthy states, grown wealthy through their own colonial genocides, are protected by their own versions of the Iron Dome. Because in fact, the Iron Dome is global. It stretches along our own fortress borders with their lethal fences and walls and detention centers. And it stretches outward into a transnational gulag of offshore mig migrant detention camps and disease-ridden barges and buoys embedded with saws in the Rio Grande and coast guards that watch ships drown in the Mediterranean. And the Iron Dome also reaches inside our impossibly unequal and affordable countries and cities. It's what pays for the ballooning police budgets and unleashes militarized force, forces to clear parks of encampments of unhoused people and to repress indigenous blockades against fossil fuel projects foisted without their consent. And it stands ready to put down the next wave of racial justice rebellions. It's also the surveillance nets tracking down whistleblowers and waging war on journalism and journalists who dare to tell the truth about our wars and surveillance, of whom Julian Assange is only the most prominent symbol. As it is for Israel, this global Iron Dome is about a belief in the prerogative of states to meet demands of people for basic rights and the basics of life with brutal state violence. A commitment to making people who fall outside of the state's project disappear by locking away, by pushing them further away, by letting them drown, and by meeting legitimate resistance with lethal force. Israel's Iron Dome is extreme because its ethno-nationalism and supremacist ideology is so extreme. But we should be clear that it is modeled on racist colonial logics in our own countries, and it is itself a model. The Iron Dome was built for export. We need to understand this because on October 7th, that model and that dome collapsed before the eyes of the world. Hamas's attack, brutal and horrific, shattered the entire illusion of safety and security for the few that this model represents. And that terrified not only Israelis, not only the Netanyahu government, but it shook our own governments to their core. Because if Israel's heavily armed walls and fences and drones and dome could not hold, what does that say about our own country's illusions of safety and control? If Israel's Iron Dome could fail, it means that all the other iron domes could also fail. That they may well not hold in the face of the mass movement of people spurred by endless war and criminal climate arson and cruel economic policies of immiseration. And that is why our governments have united in such an unprecedented way to assert their central belief system that might will make right that he who has the most advanced weaponry and the highest walls will succeed in containing and controlling the billions in desperation and need. That, I think, helps explain why the governments of the wealthy world have joined Israel's revenge frenzy with such unshakable enthusiasm and why they have been so cowardly even months in of calling for the barest of minimums, a ceasefire because they understand that Israel's unending campaign is also a form of mass communication. They understand that it's a message. It's a message being sent not only by Israel's government, but by every government that has blessed this onslaught with words, with, with votes, with vetoes at the United Nations, with photo ops, with weapons, with money, with domestic attacks on Palestine solidarity. The message being sent is a simple one that the gilded bubbles of relative safety and luxury that are dotted across our cruelly divided and fast warming world will be protected at all costs, up to and including with genocidal violence. In the many pillaged parts of our planet, this obscene message has been fully received. Gustavo Petro, the courageous president of Colombia, decoded its meaning immediately. Back in October, just a few days into Israel's onslaught, he stated, and this is a quote, the barbarity of consumption based on the death of others leads us to an unprecedented rise of fascism and therefore to the death of democracy and freedom. It's barbarism 
or Global 1933. In Israel's attack and the support from governments of the North and right-wing forces in the South, he also saw a preview of a shared future, stating, and I quote again, what we see in Palestine will also be the suffering of the world of all the peoples of the South. The West defends its excessive consumption and its standard of living based on destroying the atmosphere and climate and to defend it, knowing that it will cause the exodus of the South to the North and not only of the Palestinian people. This system, Petro reminds us, quote, is ready to respond with death to defend the consumption bubble of the rich on the planet and not save humanity, whose majority is disposable like the children of Gaza. I encourage all of you to read Petro's entire statement, which I think is historic, but I'll just skip to the end. We are going to barbarism if we do not change power. The life of humanity and especially of the people of the South depends on the way in which humanity chooses the path to overcome the climate crisis produced by the wealth of the North. Gaza is just the first experiment in considering us all disposable. What else is there to say? Perhaps only this. We are hosted today by War on Want. And as Assad reminded us, the war on want is the only war worth waging, and wage it we must. We either transform this death machine through the equitable redistribution of wealth within the boundaries of the Earth's limits, also known as a global Green New Deal, or as Jeremy called it, the Green Industrial Revolution, or this nightmare engulfs us all. All we have is each other. All we have is the movement movements that we build and the power that we build together. All we have is our solidarity, our determination, our resolve, and shared moral commitment to the preciousness of life. And with that, we can build a world without iron domes. And we can earn some hope. Thank you. Thank you, Naomi. Thank you very much. We talk often talk about the front lines of resistance, and there is no other greater front line of resistance than the resistance of our indigenous nations and peoples. And we're really deeply honored that I have Moira Milan from the Mapuche Nation join us. But Moira. Uh, tengo poco tiempo. I have a little time. Pero traía guardado en mi corazón una pequeña historia de esperanza. But I have in my heart a small story of hope. Um, vengo de un país completamente eh, negacionista. I come from a country who denies everything. Ra racista y genocida. Racist and genocide. Que es Argentina. That is Argentina. Y ese país que niega la existencia de 40 naciones indígenas and that country that denies 40 indigenous nations tiene a la población de las mujeres indígenas en la situación de más empobrecimiento, más omisión, más silenciamiento. Has the indigenous women, the ones that are the more poor, the more silenced, the more invisible. Las mujeres indígenas no solamente no somos vistas por el Estado, sino por la sociedad argentina y tampoco somos respetadas ni escuchadas por nuestros propios hombres. The indigenous women in this country, they are not only listened for the state, but also for our own men, our own male population, and the society in general. Pero un día tuve un sueño. But I had a dream, one day I had a dream. Y salí de mi comunidad al sur del país caminando. I, and I left my community from the south, I start walking. Eso fue en el 2013. That was the 2013. Y fui llegando a distintos territorios. And arrived to different territories. Y armábamos asambleas con muchas mujeres indígenas. And there we had assemblies with many indigenous women. De todos los pueblos, de todos los idiomas, de todos los colores. Of all the communities, of all the peoples and all, all colors. Y nos propusimos ser vistas por el país. 
and we decided to be seen by the country. Y fuimos a un lugar que nunca jamás nos llamaron. So we went to a place that we never was called to go. Que era el Parlamento Argentino, el Congreso de la Nación. That was the Congress, the National Congress of Argentina. Y no quisimos entrar de la mano de ningún partido político. Quisimos abrir las puertas nosotras y we, a la fuerza. We didn't want to enter by any, together with any political parties. We wanted to enter by ourselves. En ese caminar muchísimas veces estuve sola, bajo la lluvia, bajo la nieve, bajo un sol abrazador. In that walking I was by myself many times under rain, under a harsh a sun. Y, y, y me pregunté si lo íbamos a lograr. And I asked myself if we were going to get that what we proposed to do. Y en el 2015, 2015, 15,000 personas marchamos y entramos al Congreso de la Nación. 15,000 personas marchan con y we enter the Congress, the National Congress. Y, y por primera vez en la historia de ese país europeizante y racista, las mujeres tomamos la palabra. And for the first time in the history, the women, the indigenous women, enter and we took the word. We Took our own word. Y desde ahí no hemos parado uh, generando acciones directas y luchando por nuestros derechos. And since then we haven't stopped to doing direct actions fighting for our own rights. Y ahora he atravesado el mundo para traerles un sueño a ustedes. So I came from all the other side of the world to bring you a dream. En especial a las mujeres que están presentes aquí, a las mujeres de todos los pueblos, de todas las nacionalidades. Especially to all women from all nationality, from all peoples, from all towns. Porque vinculo de manera directa la guerra con el patriarcado, no solamente con el capitalismo, sino también con el patriarcado. Because we relate directly, directly to the patriarchal way. Y sé que si decidimos las mujeres del mundo caminar todas juntas y tomar los parlamentos de todos nuestros países para frenar la guerra lo podemos lograr. Because we know that if we women get together and decide to take the parliaments of every country to, to stop the war, we will do it. En el mundo mapuche, in the Mapuche world, honramos la palabra. We honor our own word. Y hoy frente a ustedes, and in front of you today, me comprometo I, I compromise myself a ser una de las que camine al Congreso de la Nación Argentina y enfrente a mi ley y tome el Congreso hasta que él firme en solidaridad con Palestina, retire la embajada argentina de Jerusalén. To be one of the women that leads a movement to enter the parliament, to enter where the Milay president is, and decide that he has to um, take, uh, I don't know, the embassy from Jerusalem. And uh, yeah, she, he, she's going to lead that movement of women there. Vamos, hermanas. Compañeras, no va a ser fácil. Va a haber represión, va a haber cárcel, quizás hasta haya muerte. Sisters, camarades, it won't be easy. It, it, maybe we will have to face death. Pero de qué vale la vida si la vivimos avergonzados porque no fuimos capaces de frenar este genocidio. But what's life for? What, what, why do we want to live if we were unable to stop this genocide? Prefiero morir luchando fighting, que, que vivir con la vergüenza de no haber hecho nada. And to live with the shame of not doing anything. Las invito, compañeras, a que abracemos este sueño y lo hagamos realidad. Marichi Huevo. I to do this dream, to make this dream reality. Marichi Huevo. Free Palestine! Thank you, Moira and Nana Wilma. I just...
Just as we are all Palestinians, we are also all Mapuche. We often talk about uh, anti-colonialism and there is no other organization that has played such an important role at the global level and at the national level than Third World Network. And I'm delighted to invite my sister and comrade, Mina Raman, who is an environmental justice lawyer, activist, thinker, to help. I could give a few more superlatives. Okay, tell me, and, and very embarrassed person, Mina. Thank you, Brother Asad Rehman. Of no relation to Mina Rahman, <laughs> but of deep solidarity and connection and vision for a better world. Um, thank you so much. So much of energy and so much of emotions running in this room. But I have a challenge for you, Asad Rahman, <laughs> that next time we come here, it will have to be the Wembley Stadium. And we can do it, and you all have to help us do that. Now, I was wondering, after all these impassioned speeches and the morning long day of analyzing capitalistic systems and imperial systems and the entire force of what's on us, I think what we all realize is that we are united in this fight together. And there are only two types of people in this world, and you might be surprised that I'm making it quite simplistic. One is if you're part of the problem or if you're part of the solution. No matter how little that solution is, I think for those of us and many of us who come from the frontline struggles, for those of us here, my sisters, my brothers, battling with communities, forest communities, battling with mining companies, battling with governments who have been oppressing us in many ways. I think the one realization that we have is no matter how much we resist and no matter how horrible the nightmare is, as it is in Gaza, in Palestine, how awful and naked the emperor is and the empire is, despite all that resistance on the ground and despite all that our people have the resilience and they continue to fight, but they don't listen to us. And who do they listen to? They listen to you, the people who live in the empires. And this is why we come here. And for the longest time, I have always struggled. How can we make the change happen in the UK? How can we make the change happen in the United States? How can we make the change happen in many parts of Europe? Because if you and your voice is heard, then we are protected. But it's not for our sake that you have to do what you have to do. It's for your own sake. So this is why some people sometimes, you know, you may not be having all this big analysis and, you know, you're not from the, you don't know what capitalism is, and I'm sure you all do. You don't know what the imperial project is, imperialistic project is all about, but I think when you see how the system actually keeps this making the poor poorer and the rich richer, how do you account for the fact that you have fascist ruling? How do you account for the fact that the European Parliament is at the risk of having more right-wing governments? How do you account for the fact that Donald Trump can get re-elected? How do you account for the fact that even the Biden administration doesn't go far enough and they are not where they ought to be? So who must hold these people to account? Who? Exactly. So for those of us who come from so far away, we are waging battles in many, many fora. We love the voice of Jeremy Coburn. We see him. We see him and he brings us hope. We love the voice of Naomi Klein and how she inspires the young with no logo. 
how we have to fight the corporate power. Now, all this is solidarity of a deep kind. Of course, war and want and the wonderful work that they do. But I think we must challenge all of you in the global north. Yeah. yeah. They keep fooling and fooling and fooling. And that you, I spoke about the naked truth and the emperor has no clothes. And that you see that's happening in Gaza and around the world. But what is even worse is the insidious, insidious, insidious agreements and policies and the manipulation of science that they continue to do that many of us don't see. We are blinded. We still live in a lot of, of, of blinding of net zero and carbon markets and, you know, and, and, it, and, and go, they go on and sell it in, you know, they say old wine in new bottle, but actually old wine is quite good. <laughs> but this is of a different poison in a different poison chalice that they keep selling us. So for many of us, we collaborate, we analyze, as Naomi has talked about, we unpack the mask, we remove the masks, we make it people like Tejal, who has a huge, Tejal, my sister, from India, fighting so hard in the intergovernmental panel on climate change, single-handedly to expose how that science is not really science, but it is a science of inequity and to a larger extent manipulated. Not easy to do. <clears throat> and for many of us <coughs> who try to unpack all this, it sounds so overwhelming. But there are many, many struggles where we have managed to do that. And I'll give you one story. There was this, the, the OECD, you all know the OECD. The OECD unleashed what was called the multilateral agreement on investment. And they wanted a multilateral agreement on investment, which was like the energy charter, which would basically mean that the corporations rule the world and that governments have no power to regulate. And that if governments took action, that the governments will be sued for billions of dollars. And we still have those agreements in place. But they wanted to leash this multilateral agreement on investment and for, for my organization and the leaders who were with us then, when they saw what was the, the writing on the wall and reading the text, you have to read the text. You have to under understand the text. And many of our governments don't speak. They don't understand. They don't have the capacity. They don't even know what's in these texts. So when, when it was shown to them that Education is going to be privatized. Hospitals are going to be privatized. Everything is in the hands of the corporations. When women realized this in many parts of the world, they said, no way this is going to happen over my name, not in my name, or not in over, it will only happen over my dead body. And that's when, you know, in Canada, you had a group of house, well, homemakers who sit and have coffee every evening Suddenly, when they were told about this by our friends and those of us who explained to them of what was coming, they said, no, this cannot happen. And they rose to action. So those who were sipping coffee nicely or knitting changed. They transformed, spoke to their neighbors. It led to the, an uprising, a challenge of government that led to the cancellation of the multilateral agreement on investment. That they did. It wasn't easy. So it's not just with guns. It's not just with bombs. They do this with many other instruments. <coughs> so we have to stand and fight. We are in a movement of, of, of trade justice campaigners. It's called Our World is Not for Sale. We are in the climate justice movement. There's a debt justice movement. But we cannot be working in silos. We need more movements to come along and more people who are not just, you know, you, we, we come here, we are moved, we, are emo we have emotions, we cry. Crying is important. Many of us cried this morning. But it's the crying and the emotion that moves the heart, that moves the mind, and moves us, that nothing will stop us, even our bodies, if we have to. And we have to rise, we have to rise, we have to rise, and nothing will stop us, and we shall overcome and if we can do that for Palestine, 
we can do that for the rest of the world. And we are in this together, and we need your solidarity more than ever. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, great honor to now introduce, uh, I was going to say probably the most well-known of the trade union leaders uh, in the UK, uh, Mick Lynch from the Railway and Maritime Transport Union, the RMT, but well-known because uh, of a trade union leader and a trade union movement and a trade union that has stood up for working people and for the working class, that has shown that through struggle, from the right to protest to the right to strike, that they stand in the interests of not just of their own members, but of the class as a whole. Mick. Well, thank you very much, and uh, thank you to War and Want for putting on such a tremendous event. Uh, and it's appropriate that we're here in the Society of Friends because that's what we're trying to build, a Society of Friends around the world. And it's great that we have the peace uh, banner at the back. Let's have it up again. <laughs> because this organisation who are hosting us today, of course, has stood out for centuries in the name of peace, in the name of dissent, in the name of struggle. They're not perfect. None of us are and they have their own history, but it's great that we're here in the Society of Friends trying to re-pledge ourselves, if you like, to the work that we all do in our own way uh, and for a society that we want to build for the future. And I'm delighted that you've invited me. Um, I'm humbled uh, by what I hear because sometimes I think that our struggles, those that come from the global north, look trivial compared to uh, those people that are around the world that we hear so much horror uh, so much exploitation, so much degradation. Uh, and in part, we're responsible because we benefit in some ways uh, as people that work for multinationals, people that work for shareholding companies and all the rest of it. But we've got to make sure, of course, that we identify with all these struggles. They give me these notes, by the way, from head office. I never read them, so. Uh, and then they complain that I never said all the points they wanted to make. Uh, but anyway, I'll just carry on as I am. Uh, but the theme about what I want to say is what we're about. What we need to be about as activists is building those movements. And what I'm interested in, and we tried it a couple of years ago with Enough is Enough, and we'll try it again in this election that's coming up. And we're not perfect. We make loads of mistakes. We're working people. But we've got to make sure the message we've been putting around, we've got to win this battle for ideas. Win the battle for peace. I remember a song, I left school in 1978, I know you can't believe that, uh, looking at me. I worked, and I went on strike in the winter of discontent, unofficially by the way, uh, at that time. But it was a song came out in reaction to the punk movement, they were saying hate and war and all this stuff. And Nick Lowe put a song out, What's So Funny About Peace, Love and Understanding, some of you might remember that. And that always struck me. We're trying to build a movement of workers and we have so many people that tell us, this bit's wrong, that bit's wrong, it's not perfect. You said that five years ago, and they voted for that a while ago. Well, we've got to put that behind us. What we've got to do is reach every working class community. That means every town hall. It means every place of worship. Because those of us that are socialists, those of us that are secular, we cannot say, well, we're not going to be with the Jewish people, we're not going to be with the Muslim people, we're not going to be with the Hindus, we're not going to be with the Sikhs, we're not going to be with the people that don't identify and think exactly as we are. We're not going to get a perfect movement, but we've got to have a unified movement. We're not going to get a perfect Labour Party. We're not going to get a perfect Keir Starmer. I don't know what that would look like. But we've got to identify what we're struggling on. In many situations, it's a binary struggle. We must get rid of this government. It's the top priority. My nightmare as a leader of the RMT, that's what they call me, but as a representative of the RMT is to wake up after that election and somehow 
this monster is stumbling on. It's only going to stumble to the right, by the way. It's going to stumble towards fascism, towards hatred, towards racism, towards bigotry. And we must stop that happening. So whatever we do in our movement, and we will support all sorts of people in the election because we're not affiliated. We will support Labour candidates. We will support socialist candidates. We will be supporting Jeremy Corbyn when he stands for election. But we must have a popular movement of the working people in this country. But it means it's got to be deep into our communities. Every community in the country standing up for progressive ideas, standing up for public ownership. We wouldn't have been in that crisis if we'd had the levels of public ownership we had under Wilson and Callaghan. We would have been able to control the price of energy. We would have been able to control housing stock. We would have been able to control poverty in a much more positive way than we had now. We should never forget what our movement built and what we've lost under 40 years of Thatcherism. And what we face around the world now, I believe, is embedded Thatcherism. We had Reagan, we had Thatcher, we had all those people getting on that bandwagon. And we're paying for it now in the Western world. And we're paying for it in the exploited world. Everyone is getting ripped off by the oligarchs, by the ruling class. And it's time we came together in a popular movement that challenges them. Because imagine a world if we weren't fighting. I know what it's like. You go home some nights and you think, why do I bother? We're not making progress. We're not winning the way we want to win. Well, Tony Benn said to us years ago, there will never be an ultimate victory. But I can tell you this. There will never be a defeat for working people. No matter what the setbacks, we will keep our networks going. We will stay united because we have the best ideas. And if there's one thing we put back on the agenda this, this year, and we've done it over the last few years, there is a class struggle going on in our society. The problem is we're not winning it, and we have to turn that around. The problem is that not enough of our people understand our values. So we have to get out. We have to keep working. We have to recommit to what brought us into the movement. We have to keep passing that on to the next generation, for the people that look at us blankly sometimes, at work, in the supermarket, wherever it is that you exist. And we have to keep fighting for what we believe in. Because what we're going to achieve one day is a free and fair society with the redistribution of wealth. And we're going to build a society that's based on socialism, that's based on fairness. And we are going to build a society with peace, love, and understanding at its heart. So solidarity to you all. Keep fighting. Lift up your hearts. Lift up your work. And let's win for the workers of the world and the people of the world and our planet. Thank you so much. Mina Pot. I, I want to end with uh, a few words about solidarity. Because there are those who say that the working class in the UK can't be won to a radical vision of solidarity. And I want to remind us that when merchants in Liverpool and Manchester were building warships to support slavery in the Confederate South, it was our class. Lancashire cotton workers who refused to handle their slave cotton. When the Daily Mail, when the Daily Mail and Britain's elites were supporting Mosley's black shirts, our class was on the streets smashing the fascists. When the British, when the British government stood silently with support, when, uh, watching Franco's fascists in Spain, it was our class that rallied to the international brigades to defend democracy. And after World War II, it was our class who founded the NHS, our education system, and our welfare system that their class has spent decades trying to dismantle. And when racists, 
were dividing working people. It was the miners who stood side by side with striking black workers at Grunwick. And when the state was starving the miners, it was the black community who opened up our churches, our gurdwaras, our temples and mosques to feed the miners. And when they, their class, was supporting an apartheid in South Africa, it was our class that was refusing to handle their blood-soaked class, their goods. And now, as their class is complicit in Israel's genocide, it's our class that is on the streets in our millions, in our billions. So as Mick says, we are fighting. We are facing a war on the working class. But it's a war that's been fought in every country in the world. And it's a war that we can only fight and have only hope at winning if we build solidarity and collective power. That's why we at War on Want, we have worked for and called for transformational uh, visions of a global Green New Deal, where we weave together our calls, weave together our demands, winning the battle of ideas, of connecting workers' rights, of demanding food sovereignty against extractivism, of challenging the politics and uh, the war of militarism and war. And we have to remind ourselves Remind ourselves of those words of Chico Mendes, the legendary Brazilian trade unionist and environmental justice campaigner, who said, ecology without class consciousness is merely gardening. <laughs> so yes, so yes, comrades, we need a new story, a collective vision, and that's what we were weaving together today. Demands that connect the working class of the North and the South where we rebuild our internationalism, where we connect and rebuild our movement of movements, anchored in an anti-imperialist vision, anchored and built on solidarity of working people, not of less, but of better, of living wages, social protection, universal public services and workers' rights, where energy and food and water are public goods owned by people, of the right to housing, of warm homes, of mass public transport, of fighting for an NHS here and a global NHS everywhere, of not only taxing fairly the wealthy and the corporate giants, but asking that question, how dare billionaires exist in this world? And our answer, not less, not less, but better, a public luxury, public luxury and private sufficiency. To do that, we know we need to do more than mobilize. We need to organize. We need to unite that power. We need to use that power. So everybody in this room, if you're not a member of a trade union, that's the first thing you should do, is join a trade union. That's our greatest strength, our greatest collective strength. It's been our greatest collective strength throughout the last hundred years and continues. And I will say, if you aren't a member of War and Want, ask yourself, why not? We are the most radical organization. The details are in the program because that is about collect collective power. It's about organizing together. It's about building power in this country and acting in solidarity with our movements all around the world. And I And I'm conscious, I'm conscious time is running out and probably the security are saying you all got to be out here at six. And I know we're going to end with our choir who've, been, uh, who've created a song today. But I, in my heart, I remember a song. It's a words of the Internationale, right? That says, comrades, come rally. And their last fight, let us face. And it's the international working class that unites the human race. So comrades, let's have the choir over. And I think on the screen we're going to get all the words of the song. So we can all join in, apart from me who's got a terrible singing voice. Hi everyone. Um, we are the UK version of the Stop Shopping Choir. It is so... 
amazing to be here. Um, I'm not going to repeat all of the incredible transformational ideas and causes and campaigns that we all stand for because we all know what they are. Um, and we are called the Stop Shopping Choir, not because it's about individual consumerism. It's an entry point into our anti-capitalist thinking and being and relating with the world. Um, Okay. Our values include decolonization, earth justice, migrant justice, human rights, community inclusion, and especially joy. We're here to use our bo bodies and our voices to help amplify these values, and we want to collaborate with you and add our voices and amplify your causes, especially. Um, and we invite you to join us, and now we invite you to join to sing with us. Mila. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we had a workshop earlier. Who was in our workshop? Wave. Yeah. So the, this is our choir, everyone. And in fact, you are also the choir. So we're going to sing through this once. Then we're going to share it line by line. Then we're going to sing it all together. Is that OK? Yeah? Because with singing, we can share our love and solidarity and build our community even more. All right. So we're going to sing it once for you. There. Storms we are blowing, we can't wait, we can't wait. Storms they are blowing. Line by line, if you'll sing with us. Storms, they are blowing. We can't wait. We can't wait. Now you. Storms, they are blowing. We can't wait. We can't wait. Storms, they are blowing. We can't wait. Storms, they are blowing. We can't wait. Storms, they are blowing. Killing all that's growing, storms they are blowing, killing all that's growing, storms they are blowing, we can't wait, storms they are blowing, we can't wait. Beautiful, okay, any questions? Just kidding, right. <laughs> all right, <laughs> so we'll do it all together now, I don't think so, um, and uh, yes. Please feel free to go crazy, go wild, to Harmonize. invent harmonies, Harmonize. So and to well. improvise yeah. manically over the top. All right. Three, four. Storms, they are blowing, we can. 